I'll be taking you through the next 40 minutes, giving you a whistle-stop tour of the tactical skills that you can take away from this conference and use next week. Please don't use them on the exhibitors or on each other. Um, but uh, this, uh, when you go away from this conference, you will see and hear things that previously you may not have noticed. Now, I'm amongst professionals and some very good experts, and some of you have seen some of this material in Southeast Asia and in Brussels, where we featured some of the activity. I'm going to take this a step further and uh, lead you into the key scientific pieces that can help you get to the truth. So some people call me a professional lie detector. I prefer to use the phrase um, uh, truth detector. Because when people tell lies, they leak the truth. I want to give you an insight to see that leakage so that you can better understand individuals in high-stake fraud investigations and wherever your work takes you. Also, your personal life. We'll be careful on that side. So I'm starting with an ethical method message. If you admit that you've been to this session, or you start uh, sharing some of the skills with your family, uh, your spouses, your lovers, or both of them. <laughs> and uh, friends uh, in the bar or in your social networks. Uh, you'll distance them from you. And although a little knowledge is a dangerous thing, I've tactically chosen information and skills which will help you with just 40 minutes worth of training. So this is a bit of a training session. And uh, rather than the still photographs and audio only I've used on previous sessions, I'll be using a few videos so you can see how good you are at picking up indications of deception. So these materials, um, I've put quite a few together and there's some support scientific papers. If you want them, just drop a business card off and we'll get these straight out to you after the conference. Uh, but the materials that you use and see are protected with uh, copyright. So please just use them for your own investigations and interviews. And if you want to share them widely, let us know and we can give you ways of doing that. So these are the aims. These have been outlined previously. We're looking at reliable indicators of deception from behavior. Look at six communication channels of which verbal content, the words we say are just one of them. And look at a strategic approach to get to the truth in fraud investigations. Uh, if you want more detail, the, the book's available through ACFE. They've got a discount on the book, so uh, take advantage here rather than on Amazon and you'll get it cheaper. These are the organizations that we work with. Uh, you'll see about 50% are police organizations, airports, intelligence services, and uh, those working in counter-terrorism, anti-terrorism, and law enforcement. We're getting a lot of demand there, as you can imagine right now. Uh, but 50% uh, of our work also takes place in the commercial sector, working with banks, insurance companies, corporations, whether it's screening for a new CEO or investigating uh, serious fraud. So there's just a few examples on there who uh, they've allowed us to share their logos. This technology can be used from informal to formal settings. My favorite's in the middle, the casual conversation. But from the indirect passive observation of behavior, whether that's a quarterly earnings call, or it's a CEO of an organization, or a CFO making a claim about the present or future performance of a business. This technology can be used to work out the credibility and truthfulness in those statements. The, uh, the care with the exclamation marks is there because this, I've been doing this for 27 years. And the best I can do at judging truth and lies from a passive video or a passive audio is about 65%. That's not good enough for high-stake decisions. So you need corroborating evidence. So I would never, ever, ever uh, make a decision on loose truth and lies from a passive video where we've not got the chance to elicit or interview the individual. Because the journalists and the interviewers often don't have the training to ask the right question at the right time to check the hypotheses of what's really going on. What's this person really thinking and feeling? But casual conversations are very useful because those are when people are relaxed. You need people to be relaxed for you to see the indicators that's created by the anxiety of deception when stakes are high. And of course, in a formal interview, these can be used too. Whether you're working as a team or as an individual, if it's a fraud investigation, uh, high stakes screening, 
uh, investments, purchasing, mer mergers, acquisitions, all those scenarios are where clients ask us to help, either by training them or by sitting on the panels to screen individuals through that process. So there's a, a wide range. The Light to Me program was mentioned by Bruce and uh, Dr. Paul Ekman, uh, my colleague, was a scientific advisor on Light to Me. I just want to do a quick straw poll. Can you just raise your hand if you, you've heard of this program? Okay, about 60%. That's useful. For those who haven't, uh, this guy in the middle, Tim Roth, plays a guy called Dr. Cal Lightman. He's the head of the organization, very similar to what we do, uh, but this is a drama. Don't use Light to Me as a training course because you'll do worse than those who haven't watched the program because they've got to save the world in 45 minutes plus advertisements. And um, the, uh, the executive producer, Sam Bone, said, look, Dr. Ekman, we need to reserve the right to uh, embellish the science a little bit. So he said, okay, you can use my name, but we run a blog and we have that on the website, eiagroup.com website, to, so you can look at which bits of light to me are science and which are myths, just used for the drama. So this is drama. But uh, how good you are at lie detection, I've got a, uh, just a couple of uh, facts for you. First of all, uh, two minutes on your tables or as a group. Uh, if you've only got two minutes, we need to move on. But why are women better than men at lie detection? Go. Okay, thank you. I think everyone's worked that out now. You're, uh, you're calming down and the, uh, the noise is, is quietening. Unfortunately, there's no evidence to support that. But it'd be interesting to, uh, to hear the bias and the perceptions and the reasons. And uh, I'd have guessed that women would be the best because they've got to suffer men. Uh, but that's not the case. Uh, there is no empirical evidence to support that women are better than men, and neither are men better than women in the research we've done across 20 countries in eight languages. But there's a perception that they are, uh, but it's, uh, it's not upheld by our findings. And what about your ability to detect deception? Here's your next exercise. I'm only going to give you one minute for this. Go. How good are you at deception, detection? One means poor, ten means high. Share with your partner, please. Okay. Members of the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners. How many people are eight or above, please? Can you raise your hands? Oh, about 5%. You're, you're so modest. Uh, how many people are uh, six or lower, please? Okay, that's a huge percentage. What the uh, st statistics tell us is that fraudsters and criminals are better than most of us at lie detection. And unfortunately, when uh, meta studies are pulled together, most of us are no better than chance around the 50%. It's actually 54% when you take an average of all these sectors. This is a meta-study done by uh, Alder Ray. And uh, the criminals did the best. That's the concern. They've, they've, got, a, they've got a start on us. 65% was their average. It's only one study with 52 people. Uh, but when you look at the multiple studies from the other professionals, uh, we average around about 54% if we're not trained in behavioral detection and behavioural analysis and lie detection. And that forms part, uh, but you'd be surprised how little a part that forms in police training, judge training, lawyer training. And uh, you know from your own training how much exposure you've had to this. So untrained people, 54. Trained people were hitting 90s uh, consistently with our groups after only four days training. So I've just come back from Romania with the intelligence service and some aviation security specialists who are trying to keep their country safe from terrorism and the 23 averaged 47 at the start of the four days. And after four days training, we took them into the airport working with real people and red teams, and we got them uh, up to a post test of 83.6. And that's not unusual. This is a trainable skill. It's not something you're born with. Some people are born with it. One in 10,000 uh, is the figures and the estimations are wizards. Uh, they're, uh, they're born with the skill to tell the difference between uh, those who are telling truth and those who aren't. But those are a rare animal. I'm not one of those. One of my sons is. He's part of our business. And he's had to learn what it is he sees and hears that gives him that confidence to make those discriminations between lies and truth. 
but most of us need training, and uh, not much. It's a trainable skill. And the science versus the myth, the what do you believe is the most reliable behavioral indicator of deception? Please share for uh, 30 seconds on your table. Go. Okay, thank you. Unfortunately, you're all wrong. <laughs> and the reason is, uh, I've steered you a little bit with um, a, a reliable indicator. There is no single reliable, reliable indicator of deception. There's no Pinocchio's nose. However, there are some reliable indicators which, when clustered together, can give you a lot of confidence whether someone is telling the truth or lying about their historical story, about their identity or their future intent, which is Andy in much of our work. And the reason is a polygraph doesn't pick up lies, it picks up anxiety. And are you anxious because you're being wired up to a machine? Uh, it's like my mother going through the airport green channel. She's, she's anxious without carrying three bottles of whiskey. <laughs> or are you anxious because you fear being disbelieved because you're telling the truth? False positives. Or are you anxious because you don't want to be caught telling a lie? True negative. So those are the three hypotheses that need checking out, and the polygraph can't do that. And the National Research Council supports it with uh, 12 to 16 pieces of good research about the usefulness of the polygraph. It does have its uses with guilty knowledge tests and concealed information. Uh, however, in a general sense, um, relying on a polygraph is, uh, is, needs to be approached with some caution. And the reason uh, that we t when we tell lies we leak the truth uh, can be uh, illustrated with this picture. When we tell lies, we leak the truth. So that's important. People think uh, that individuals leak lies. No, no. The lies usually come in the form of words. It can be symbols, can be emblems, but most of the time it's in the form of words. And they're often believed because our teachers and parents tell us, listen to the words I'm saying. And often the leakage comes from the other channels, which I'm going to share with you. And the reason that does that is because the autonomic nervous system reacts within about 400 milliseconds to display the emotions you're really feeling, whether you want to show those or not. So not like a reflex where you strike the knee and the, uh, that's just a short signal to the spinal cord and back out. Uh, that's not an emotion. But when uh, we're triggered into an emotion, someone angers us within four, 500 milliseconds, we get a reaction from the body. It's orchestrated our blood flow, our breathing patterns, our perspiration, and everything which supports the action you need when you're threatened is supported by the body without thinking. And those signals are valuable to the behavioral analyst. So you might strike someone within three quarters of a second of the stimulus, the confrontation, or insulting your partner, or trying to hurt your children. But if you can be aware of that happening and you can manage the emotion, you can respond rather than react. React is what chimpanzees do. We've been gifted with a prefrontal cortex, which can help us to just send it around the brain another time, only one second, you don't need to count to 10, one second to think about, is what I'm gonna do now appropriate? And that means you can respond. You may still choose to strike, but that's a choice, rather than the chimpanzee working and overpowering you. So those reactions are coming from deep inside the emotional brain. And uh, the, it's not just the content, the words are being said, but the verbal style, uh, the way we speak, the voice, the music of the voice, the speed, the rhythm, pitch, volume, tone, is affected by the emotional reactions that are going on in our autonomic nervous system. You've also got the face, facial expressions, body language and psychophysiology. In the, uh, in the paper that uh, we published and had peer-reviewed, we've got all these detailed with all the examples, and uh, those are in the public domain, so, uh, so you, you can get those. Just let me know, drop me an email address, and you can have all the detail. But I'm going to cover a few of them now for you. You'll see a diagram where when emotion, what you're feeling and what you're thinking, cognition, are at odds with each other because you're making up a lie, you're fabricating a story, you're covering the truth, then that leakage comes out from one of those six channels. And if that leakage is inconsistent with the account, baseline, and context, the story they're telling is the account, the baseline is the idiosyncratic behavior of that individual, we all have tics and behaviors, 
we've not we need to calibrate and check the baseline if it changes and moves from that baseline it's an indicator and does it fit with the context if you've been interrogated with a um, oppressive interview style you're going to create leakage but it's not because they're deceptive always it's because they're reacting to the oppressive interview style so that creates pins points of interest the problem is when you're dealing with an individual that data is coming at you like a fire hose and we need to narrow it down for you so the research paper I'm sharing with you will give you a picture of these points of interest which is a behavioral indicator from one of the six channels which is inconsistent with the ABC. And there's 27 of them that are very reliable and substantiated by science. And it looks like a paper like this. Uh, you won't be able to read that from the front, never mind the back, uh, but there's a list of 27 indicators down the left. And this was used in high stake uh, criminal situations where criminals or innocent people were making appeals for the return of a loved one, like the Susan Smith scenarios. The, uh, any, uh, where, where someone's gone missing when really the perpetrator is sat in front of the camera trying to make an appeal to find out who did it. So with 73 we studied and half were telling the truth and half were perpetrators and uh, these criteria separated the wheat from the chaff, the good guys from the bad guys, most of them were guys, uh, some girls. So that's been published and that's uh, available to you. On the face, we look at the facial action coding system. Does the facial muscle if they're claiming to be sad and the inner brows aren't supporting that, because most people can't do this, uh, when they pretend to be sad, they bring the brows down and stick the lip out, which is a childish sulk. But no one sulks in an empty room. This is an indicator for attention, where sadness is a felt emotion. So if someone is feigning or feeling an emotion, you can see it if you learn these muscles. And I'm going to whiz you through these and test you on a video. The duration of an emotion, they're quick, they happen to us, they're unbidden, and they last between one and a half and six and a half seconds. And they have a symmetry across the face. They synchronize top and bottom of the face, and they have a smooth onset and smooth offset. Not an immediate offset from a smile that the air stewardess might display when she's finished serving you, or steward. So there's five indicators for the face. And these are shown through seven emotions, which are anger, disgust, fear, surprise, contempt, sadness, and happy. Here is anger. Uh, these, are, these are going to be in your packs. Uh, but the inner brows are down, angry birds, uh, with a glare on the eyes, and the margins of the lips rolled in. Here's disgust, with a wrinkled nose and the upper lip bearing the teeth open. Here is contempt, the Elvis Presley, appropriate for here, the Elvis Presley lip, uh -huh. Um, is a sign of contempt, moral superiority, or it could be done by the corner of the lip. Would you like a quick test? Okay. This is the chief executive of the cooperative, grant, uh, co cooperative group, a UK uh, banking corporation. See if you can see any flashes of emotion on his face. Well, let's speak to Peter Marks. He's the chief executive of the cooperative group at the Stock Exchange for us. Uh, Peter, good morning to you. Um, now, just looking at your results that you've published this morning, uh, last year you had record results, uh, profits up there almost 50%, but you've called this some of the worst trading conditions you've seen in your history at the firm. Uh, are there any signs out there that it's getting better? I wish I could say there were, but you know, in the short term, which is the next 12 months, we don't see uh, many signs of, of the consumer being uh, more confident. Now, uh, the uh, update on your supermarket business, of course, uh, still challenging out there, as you talk about, because consumer spending is squeezed. Uh, your banking division doing a little better, though. Just talk us through some of these figures. Yeah, well, as you say, um, you know, overall, uh, a 6% fall against what was a record year last year, we think, in the context of the economic climate, is pretty good. So a 6% 6% fall is pretty good. So why did his face go like this? So when we see that leakage of uh, scorn, it's called in the US, um, in the UK that's catching on now, which is a blend between anger and disgust. So when we see anger and disgust, like on the left there, when he talks about the next 12 months, or the consumers, if only they keep spending, we wouldn't have this problem. He blames the consumers. He's got this moral superiority towards uh, this is the public's fault, not his. And uh, he flashes this again when he talks about the next six months, which is pretty good, but his face doesn't say so. 
He says he's angry and disgusted at the point he's saying those words. Now, the journalist, I was screaming at the TV at this stage, this was uh, three years ago, to say, ask him who do you blame for this? Ask him who you blame for this? Um, but that didn't come out on the interview because these signs weren't picked up on. So this can help you to look at who's involved, who's not involved, and how they're feeling about what's happening. Fin finishing off the seven expressions, you've got surprise. A quick flash of the face, which is quite easy to see. This lasts for one second. Any more, and they're probably feigning it as a signal to try and make you think they're surprised. So this is useful. Everyone can do this, but if it lasts for more than two seconds, there's deception probably at, at stake here. But they might be doing it for a good reason. My wife does a, a birthday surprise party, but I found out. I don't want to uh, spoil it for her. So my best thing to do is do a genuine expression, not a fake one. <laughs> so fear is a, a tension which shows across the eyes are still wide. The brows go up and they squeeze together and the mouth goes back with the resorus muscle towards the chin bone. And we can see it intuitively, uh, but you'd be surprised how many people miss these expressions when they happen quickly. And sadness, that's what real sadness looks like. Brows up and the mouth corners down. That's genuine sadness. And if you hold that, don't hold that. I don't want to spoil the conference for you. But if you hold that for seven to ten seconds, it will put you in a sad state. Because the face is hardwired to the emotion, the emotion creates the face. And therefore, when people feel sad, uh, they show it. When they're feigning sadness, uh, often it doesn't look like this. It is asymmetrical, the mouth isn't involved, and it's not connected together. So you're looking for this syn synchrony across the face and with the rest of the body. Where happiness is quite easy. We can all do this with the mouth, but you'd be surprised how many people can't wrinkle the orbicularis oculi muscle around the eyeballs, unless you're really feeling happy. So just forcing the mouth up is a social smile. But if you're feeling happiness, the eyes will crinkle, so you know whether they're feeling happy. So these look the same, but the one on the left is felt, the one on the right is feigned. The body language, there's 120 books that I've studied, and 90% um, of them are misleading. There's only five reliable indicators on the body language. Be careful you don't get drawn away with nose and neck rubs and feet pointing towards the door and so on. Gestural slips are interesting. If people uh, suddenly, they're pushing the spectacles up and they suddenly switch to their middle finger, <laughs> that's gesture, they probably don't know they've switched. Uh, if you just have a look at Senator Obama uh, flipping the bird you, on YouTube, you'll find some good examples. But often these gestural slips, the, my, uh, the ones I'm finding most often are these, yes, I can certainly do that, with a slight head shake, no. Or, no, I didn't do it, with a slight head shake, yes. Or the shoulder shrug, which is, I have no idea what I'm talking about. If someone is saying something positively and that leaks on one shoulder, uh, yes, I can do that. They often don't know they're doing that. That's a gestural slip which contradicts a positive statement. And you should listen to the body. Sometimes that shrug comes in the form of a hand gesture. And when they're clamping the body so they don't leak, you often get this little rotation of the palm. And you just see the thumb move, half an inch to an inch. That's part of the big gesture, but it's a gestural slip. We call it B1. It's one of the key reliable indicators about what someone's really thinking and feeling. And if it contradicts the words, you've got a hot spot there, a pin, point of interest. Illustrators, we look for them being synchronized synchronized or changes increase or decrease there's no absolute illustrators or manipulators one body part touching another does not mean deception but if they increase and decrease and they can't be explained by the ABC the story being told the baseline of the person and the context or change of context that you've got them in uh, then they're uh, ignore them tension body tension if it's suddenly if they suddenly clamp up with their legs wrapped around the chair then that's useful and the eyes, blinking rates, can help us. The voice, the pitch and the volume can help us. We've got other channels which are style, the way, the flow of the speech, evasion and impression management. They are, these are all explained in, uh, in the book and the free material I can send you. And content, the tense. People using past tense about living people. Distancing words, uh, like uh, that woman rather than Monica. 
And CBCA, Statement Analysis, uh, this is a way of analysing text using the courts. Uh, statement Validity Assessment forms part of the recipe we need to use. And verbal slips when you're trying to hide the truth. We look at galvanomic as well, and uh, the heart rate and temperature. You can see this on foreheads. You can see breathing rate changes. You can see people swallowing. You don't need gadgets to pick up these signals, and they form part of the recipe. But the key is, and to round off before I test you with a final video, the clusters are key, and we're looking for three indicators across two channels within seven seconds of a probe or a question. If you don't see those clusters, if you only see one indicator, ignore it. Two indicators, ignore it. But if you've got three indicators of the ones we've listed, um, they happen across two or more channels, corroborated. Within seven seconds of a stimulus, it's highly likely connected to your stimulus. And if those are indicators that cluster, then it's highly likely to be deception. Because everything happening within seven seconds from the question finishing off, left to right there, is highly likely related to your stimulus. After that, they're in charge because they're telling you their story the way they want to tell you. So here's uh, Ian Huntley, a guy who uh, killed two young uh, girls in his school to wrap up. And just see if you can see any signals from the ones we've just highlighted in this sh very short video. He only says three words. Throughout any of this, Ian, was there any occasion that you actually came into contact, physical contact, with the girls? Physical contact? Mm -hmm. yeah. okay. What we had there was a range of uh, eight indicators across three channels. He increased his manipulators, his body went back. He repeated the question back to buy himself some, he heard the question, and he claimed not to understand the question. The body tension, the single-sided shoulder shrug, and the volume went down like Cato, uh, physical contact, no, by about half. And uh, the head shake said no, and then did the head shake afterwards. So that's eight indicators from three words. Convincing, this points of interest now make this person a person of interest and can give you the confidence that there's something, something major uh, happening here. And part of the secret to getting to that point is the uh, funnel that we've got in our associated papers, which you, I'm guess, using all the time, of moving from the general, getting the story. There are good closed questions. Some people say don't use closed questions, but asking someone at the end of your 10 minutes interview, are you telling me the truth? Yes. Is this a true story? No. The number of times we see that, or the shoulder shrug, is, uh, is huge where, so when you use closed questions. So don't read the textbooks that say only use open questions. Closed questions are good if you bring people down the funnel into the tactical closed questions at the end. Thank you very much.